the title of this talk is about how we can improve uh, resource allocation in agriculture using the commodity futures markets. <clears throat> so uh, in this talk, uh, I do three things. The first is to just remind all of us of the economic purpose of the uh, commodity futures markets. Some of it will appear obvious, but it's worth reiterating this every now and then so we know who we are and what we are trying to do. And uh, the debate in India has been muddied very often. The second is a strategic picture of what are we trying to achieve in terms of the economic policy. And the third is digging into nuts and bolts of the tangible uh, public administration problems at FMC and uh, how we will build FMC into achieving those uh, strategic objectives. So let's get started with the economic purpose. Uh, to fix intuition, imagine a situation around the Kharif harvest where uh, we are going to sow something in June and uh, there will be a harvest in uh, October and uh, the things will be scarce and expensive in March just before the next rabi crop comes along. Okay. Now, uh, in this, there are two really big allocative decisions that are made. The first big allocative decision is in June, you decide whether to sow an object P1 or an object P2. Okay. So what am I going to sow in June is the first major allocative decision. And I say land, but everything goes with it. It is Once you sow, you're putting your resource into it. It is land, labor, water, fertilizer, everything. The critical allocative decision is that do I sow product P1 or do I sow product P2? The second major economic decision in this story is the storage decision, which is that in October, around harvest time, when the goods are the cheapest, I make a storage decision about whether I'm going to store P1 or I'm going to store P2. Okay, So uh, there are budget constraints. There is no free lunch. And there's only so much of warehousing capacity available. So do I choose to store P1 or do I choose to store P2? These are the two main resource allocation decisions hiding inside this entire sector. Okay, so you want, if you think deeply about this process, it's basically a production question and a storage question. Once society has answered these two questions, you've got the main logic worked out. Now, the role of the futures market is because the futures price makes visible in June what is profitable. Yes, of course. Uh, the futures price makes visible in June what is our best information about what will happen in October. So I'm standing in June and I'm trying to decide should I do P1 or should I do P2? And by looking at the futures price, I work out my profit that how much revenue will I make if I sow P1 and what revenue will I make if I sow P2? And I figure out which one makes more money for me. And I choose my decision based on that. So the futures price uh, impounds all information about what's going to be the market conditions in October. And that guides the decision making in <coughs> June. In similar fashion, the storage decision in October. Okay, So a man has to decide whether I buy P1 and I store it or I buy P2 and I store it. And then he sits and makes all the calculations that what will be the cost of storage and so on. And the futures market guides him on what will be the price in March. Okay, so this is a stylized depiction of the role that the futures market plays. The futures market guides the two main economic decisions of this sector, the storage decision and the production decision. So that's why we need a futures market. And I just want to pick, put a face behind these two decisions. Who is the man who makes that decision on allocating the land? He's a farmer. So the decision about the land, labor, water, fertilizer, all that is made by the farmer. And who is the man who makes the decision on the allocation of storage? Partly there are firms that specialize in storage and partly it's being done in an invisible way by the cash and carry arbitrage on the futures market. Okay, So these are the uh, two groups of people that are participating in the storage question. Now in this uh, picture, I want to emphasize that the allocative decision is made by looking at the price which you look in the newspaper. That's all. You don't need to be a participant on the futures market. You just need to open the newspaper. Once you open the newspaper, you get a number for what is the futures price. And you use that and you make a decision. That futures price is a public good. It is non-rival. It is non-excludable. Everybody benefits. So there are beneficiaries all over India who look at the futures price and based on that, they make their decisions. And it's a public good. Uh, what The point I want to emphasize is that you don't have to be a direct user of the futures market. You don't have to be trading on the futures market to be a beneficiary 
of improved allocative decisions by using the futures market. There are also auxiliary functions which many of us tend to think a lot about. People can do risk management using the futures market. But you know, at heart, I want to say that's an auxiliary function. At heart is the allocative decision. The heart and soul of economics is allocation. And the allocation decision is not linked to risk management. The allocation decision is just that information. I get a number out of the futures market. It guides me on uh, what I should be doing. And that's the biggie. Uh, what do I need in order to achieve those sound prices? We need two things. The first is we need that speculative price discovery. That there should be people who look at October and make forecasts and have an estimate for what will be happening in the country in October or what will be happening in the country in March. And they will trade in the market, and they will do that speculation. And out of the speculation, we will get the price. Okay. So the first raw material that we need is lots and lots of people who look at the world, make forecasts about the future, have the guts to put their money where the mouth is, and uh, discover a price on the futures market. And the second thing is, we need lots and lots of arbitrage. The arbitrage constrains the price, it disciplines the price. So there are certain prices that are just not feasible, and the arbitrage is what rules them out. <clears throat> uh, so I know this is a very sophisticated audience, but it is important for all of us to put aside the baggage that we have in India about these markets. So we think there's something bad if farmers are not using futures markets. And as I said, as long as the man can look in the newspaper and find out the price of October, he is a beneficiary of the futures market, even if he's not trading in it. Uh, we think there's something bad if hedgers are not the dominant users. Again, I will think the hedgers are an auxiliary function of the futures market. The number one function is make me a price, make me a good price. Then the old bugbear where uh, based on old Bengali movies, we think that hoarding is a bad thing. Uh, we think speculation is a bad thing. We think arbitrage is a bad thing. And you know, we think that there's something morally wrong if a man in Taiwan is trading in a futures on Guar Gum while it's being grown in Bikaner, it somehow boggles the mind. But you know, maybe a guy sitting in Taiwan will process the data and arrive at a view about Guar Gum. And there's nothing wrong with that. We should not get nervous. And these are just myths and we should leave them behind. So that was just a brief recapitulation of the economic purpose of these markets. What is it that we want to achieve? Now let's turn to a strategic picture of what uh, we would like to do in making these markets work properly. There are three kinds of market failures when we try to set up these markets. Okay? There is a problem of market abuse, there is a problem of microprudential regulation, and there is a problem of consumer protection. Uh, market abuse is somebody who fakes the price or fakes the liquidity. Okay? So this is the biggest crime of all. Because a moment ago I was saying that there is a farmer who is far away, who is not even a direct user of the futures market. He opens a newspaper, he takes a number and he makes decisions using it. Or there is storage. There are people who make decisions about storage based on looking at uh, future prices. But what if those future prices are falsified? That is the biggest crime of all around securities markets. To distort the price, to manipulate the price, to manipulate the liquidity is the biggest crime of all. And we need a government that will detect and block attempts by bad people at falsifying these prices. That is the number one function of the government in blocking this market failure. The second is the problem of microprudential regulation. The exchange and the clearinghouse must just work. I put in money, the goods should come out. I put in goods, the money should come out. I should never doubt. There should never be any perception that there is credit risk in the exchange, that the exchange can collapse. Okay, I should have that complete certainty that the exchange is a machine and it will just work. It will be a utility. It will just work. The third is a problem of consumer protection. All users of the market should be entitled to certain protections and unsophisticated users should be entitled to higher protections. Okay, so these are the three kinds of problems which motivate the involvement of a government in the futures market. So in order to achieve a liquid and efficient market, we need a government agency we need the Forward Markets Commission to identify and address these three market failures. Uh, once that is done, we need low entry barriers. We need more and more speculators and arbitragers from all over the world to come and participate in these markets. That will give us liquidity, that will give us information. And we should also scour the landscape and find all sorts of weird stuff where there are interventions by the government that uh, don't have market failures as the motivation, those interventions should go. 
and there are interventions by the government that prevent free entry of arbitrages and speculators from all over the world those restrictions must go okay. so we should focus the involvement of the government upon these three market failures that is what we need a government for everything else is illegitimate and uh, should go uh, i want to harp on a theme that we find all across finance this is the theme of organizational capital okay so let's pause to think for a moment about who is going to do that speculation and arbitrage okay so sure it can be done by individuals in india for a long time we have had little families who trade this okay they are lone rangers they do their stuff these activities are done much better when you can organize a team of individuals okay so this is the standard story of production that you can have an individual a lone ranger who will do some work but when you organize individuals into a firm you can do things in a more professional way you can systematize the work you can create incentive structures you can create specialization ever since adam smith we have known that a firm will do this work better through specialization and uh, bringing a greater mass of talent into solving the problem okay uh, this is the biggest weak link in indian finance in all fields but particularly in the commodities field the commodities field is filled with families it is really individuals who are lone rangers what we need in this field is formalization what we need is formal sophisticated firms that will build up organizational capital okay organizational capital is the sum total of the knowledge of the individuals it is process manuals it is equity capital it is the whole rhythm of being a modern financial firm uh, this is in my reckoning the weakest link of the commodities field in india today that we just have a minuscule fraction of these kinds of firms and we need to do that and in this i want to say every time you do a ban you are killing that organizational capital okay so every time a government agency whether it's rbi or fmc bans something or there is a quantitative restriction and the restriction is reached the firm doesn't sit there paying salaries while people are doing no work the teams get disbanded the people get sacked the firm gets shut down you know nobody sits there holding organizational capital when the business has stopped so every time we do a ban we destroy the organizational capital and then we have to start all over again okay we repeatedly go down to sub saharan levels and then we start building again we've been doing this over and over in indian finance and that is a big mistake which we should make we should not ban things it takes years it takes decades to build organizational capital it's not easy as any of many of us have been involved in the working of financial firms financial firms are rich complex beings it is hard to accumulate that experience the knowledge the process manuals the internal checks and balances overcoming the internal principal agent problems at various levels inside the organization a financial firm is a very complex beast so we should not destroy these things we should let them mature and scale up over the years uh so the question we should be asking ourselves is how can you create an environment where there is learning by doing inside financial firms how do you create an environment where the financial firms have incentives where the manager will invest in it systems where the processes will become more mature where there is a complex web of contracts where every firm chooses to produce something internally contract out something there is a outsourcing firm which has a capability to do something these things take years to develop that web of contracts we have to give the owners and managers of the firm a long term perspective for them to become mature in this fashion they have to have the confidence that they are in a stable business and government will not do something random government will not shut them down government will not mess up their business and in my opinion too often in indian finance governments have done random things which have just destroyed an entire business where a firm has had to be shut down so to the extent that the private sector thinks that the government will do weird things in the future they will not invest then they will be very narrow minded they'll be short sighted they'll just say look i'm putting a little capital because who knows what will come tomorrow when the government establishes long term sound frameworks then the private sector will invest more and these firms will become more mature and that's really the big story of what we have to do uh in terms of the strategic picture i would like to emphasize that convergence between securities and commodities is something that will benefit this process of maturation uh, we have a lot more maturity in the mainstream securities business and really commodity futures is a subset of the securities business there is nothing happening inside commodities which is not securities activity we can harness that organizational capital of securities firms by connecting the commodities world more closely 
to the securities firm. So <clears throat> we should be thinking that every sophisticated individual or firm in the securities business is a potential participant in the commodities field and we can use them, we can use their knowledge, we can use their capital and we can grow the complexity and the capability of the commodities field. That will short circuit the 25 year process of rebuilding that same capability from scratch. So yeah, we can do it from scratch. We can start where India started on the equity market in the early 90s, but we can short circuit that process by harnessing these people and the process manuals and the uh, capabilities inside this market. So for example, the incredible capabilities at NSC on algorithmic trading should just come effortlessly into this field. We should not wait 20 years for this field to get into algorithmic trading. To, towards this objective of convergence, we should be removing artificial barriers between the two fields. We should have greater harmonization of policy between SEBI and FMC so that the two are not wildly discordant. And as far as humanly possible, we should harmonize operations at the level of software and data formats and all that. So I'll give you a trivial example. Every securities firm has a back office. The back office of dealing with a securities exchange is no different from the back office of dealing with a commodities exchange. With a little bit of generalization, they are the same. So we should just standardize the file formats so that one single back office software, one single back office inside the securities firm is finishing the whole thing. So whether you have to do back office activities on the security side or you have to do back office activities on the commodity side, it should be the same. So that way we get economies of scale, we get economies of scope. Uh, the next point I would like to come to is internationalization. There is a huge opportunity for India in agriculture, in internationalization. In most other things, I'm not convinced that there is a big internationalization opportunity in India in commodities. Uh, you know, the global gold market is going to be in London for a long, long time. I don't really see a great opportunity for India in many of these other things. But there are 10 or 20 agricultural commodities where India is a giant on the global scale, either as a producer or as a consumer. And uh, it can really be the case that the world price is made in India. The locus of global price discovery in 10 or 20 large important agricultural commodities can be here in India. And it would be a strategic objective that would be worth pursuing. That It matters because India reaps the revenues from the extent to which the globe participates in this and also we reap all the complexity and capability more and more capable firms will be here looking at this stuff trading this stuff okay so you want the Cargill to do more here you want the Hindustan Unilever to do more here so then their engagement with this sector goes up you get more high skill people high skill jobs here in India doing this our capabilities our human capital goes up <coughs> And uh, once this, uh, these markets are working properly, they have numerous applications. I want to talk about two. The first is in the area of retail financial products. Consider the possibility of an agricultural loan that is bundled with a futures contract. It's a classic old idea. It has been around for a long time, but it has never been done yet. Consider a more complicated retail financial product, which is a blend of weather insurance and commodity derivatives and debt. All these can come together into products that will be extremely attractive to the end users in India and we need financial firms that will be able to innovate and pull these things together. Uh, for the government, uh, in my view, in most cases, society does not need for government to do agricultural risk management. This is something that is done quite adequately by the private sector. But if you do want a government to do agricultural risk management, it is far better to hold a portfolio of uh, futures and options rather than holding FCI go-downs. Okay, so FCI go-downs is the least efficient way for a government to be involved in the field of risk management. So the, we should be putting the risk management activities of the Indian state into the Indian uh, commodity futures exchanges. Okay, now if that's our economic purpose and if these, this is our uh, set of strategic objectives, how do we translate that into a tangible public administration agenda and how do we build FMC? How do we make a world-class FMC which uh, will be able to fulfill all these aspirations? Uh, I just want to remind everybody that we are not in the Indian Financial Code. We are not in the Securities Contract Regulation Act. We are in the world of the Forward Contracts Regulation Act. And it is different in interesting and important ways. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the details of this slide. If there is interest, we can come back into this uh, in a moment. Let's focus on FMC. How do we do the organizational design of FMC in the spirit of 
the way FCRA works. Okay, so we are very mindful of the text of FCRA. There are ten people in this room who have studied FCRA thoroughly, excluding yours truly. But mm -hmm. there are others in this room who know FCRA properly, and we want to go towards the regulatory governance principles from the Indian Financial Code and from the Handbook of uh, Governance Enhancing uh, uh, Principles from the FSLRC. So the first step of that is the question of mandate. <clears throat> we need to move certain powers and we need to build capacity at FMC. Uh, the FCRA permits central government to delegate most powers under Section 26 of the Forward Contracts Regulation Act to the FMC and we think that that is something that needs to be done. This includes the grant of recognition and registration, the uh, power to supersede the governing body, the power to withdraw recognition. We feel all these should be done at FMC in the spirit of an autonomous regulator as has been the case with SEBI. All these powers are done at SEBI level. So it is within the powers of government to delegate these powers and uh, we think that should be done. And we need to build capacity. At present, FMC is less than 80 people and we need to grow the organization considerably. Now, uh, as has been emphasized by FSLRC, every regulator is a mini-state who violates the separation of powers by having a legislative and an executive and a judicial function. And all these three are put together inside a regulatory agency and we need to think carefully about how each of these are done. In the FMC context, what is the legislative function? It is the making of regulations. What is the executive function? It is business permissions, inspections, investigations and prosecution. And what is the judicial function? Suspension of members, withdrawing recognition. These are the three uh, pillars of what happens inside FMC. So we would suggest that these three functions should be used to define the organization design. Okay? So we would suggest that there should be one department that does regulation making, which frames regulations which go to the commission for approval, but there should be one department which just works on regulation making. There should be one department which does supervision. There should be one department that does enforcement. And there should be one service bureau of information management which serves the other three departments. So that would be a nice way to uh, organize the commission. The key insight in organizational design is accountability. That every department should have written down measures, should have written down rules that define the success of that department. Okay, so... A department's objective should be clear. If a department has a vague title or has a vague objective, then that is cover for non-performance. A department should have clarity of objective. So the regulation-making department, how will we judge the regulation-making department? We will go back and do the ex-post cost-benefit analysis, a la IFC. So we verify that you wrote a regulation, ex-post, did the benefits outweigh the costs. That's an accountability of the regulation-making. We will do an ex-post measurement of the extent to which the regulation addressed the market failure. So in the FSLRC process, every time a regulation is written, the regulator has to articulate what is the market failure I'm trying to address. Okay, well, two years later, we'll go back and look, did you ad actually address that market failure? And the extent to which you did that is an accountability mechanism. We know that regulations are good if they have these exposed uh, performance measures and they pass with flying colors, great. Then we know that the regulation making department is working properly. The second is uh, business permissions and supervision. We can hold them accountable by looking at time. So how much time does it take to process an application that gives you a measure of the process efficiency inside there. On inspections and investigations, we should be taking a process perspective. How many inspections took place? How many violations were detected per inspection? Uh, how many adjudicatory decisions came out on the basis of investigative reports when they got appealed in litigation later on what fraction of the time did the commission win and so on these are performance measures of in inspections and investigations um, we feel that the uh, results framework what is rfd results framework. results framework document of fmc should be grounded in this performance uh, measurement so that the uh, accountability of FMC is aligned with the production of departments that deliver the results. Okay, So there should be no misalignment between the RFD by which FMC is held accountable and the mechanism by which the departments inside FMC are held accountable. Now in terms of regulatory governance at the level of the commission, uh, we feel there should be IFC mechanisms for the selection and the appointment of members and there should be written down rules 
through which uh, that is being done. This is something for Ministry of Finance to build because this is also a question that Ministry of Finance faces with all the regulatory agencies. Uh, one member with legal expertise should oversee only the prosecution and the judicial functions so that you get some element of separation of powers. Once again, like uh, what has been done in the IFC, uh, we should follow all IFC mechanisms for the board meetings so that there is complete transparency. The agenda comes out before the board meeting. The minutes are released. There is formal voting. It is clear who sub supported which initiative, who voted against which initiative. All that transparency should be a part of the working of the board. On the legislative functions, again, as in IFC, we would argue that every regulation-making project should begin with a mandate from the board, go down to the leg legislation-making department, which should run the full IFC process, and then it comes back for approval by the board. Only the board should be able to issue regulations. And the IFC mechanisms of cost-benefit analysis, notice and comment, will ensure that there is a lot of thinking and public discussion and people have an opportunity to criticize a draft regulation and so on. Uh, I'm going, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through executive functions, but this is basically drawing on the handbook and uh, Gopal and you both know exactly what I have here, so I'm going to uh, skip through it. The same uh, with uh, the judicial functions. Bottom line is our outcome should be that FMC performs some clear, clearly understood statutory functions effectively. It should have capacity and resources that match or exceed those of SEBI. Okay. Our aspiration should be that within one year, FMC is the most respected regulator of the country and not SEBI. Okay. So that I feel we should be, we are literally one year away from that, that FMC can beat SEBI within one year if all of us will put our minds to it. And we should use IFC principles on the regulatory governance. We should be grounded in rule of law and prevent fraud and abuse. Uh, in terms of tangible steps, how would all this get done? We have seven tangible steps. And I, right now I want to talk about them at high level and I'll race through them in more slides where we have worked out the specific details. Uh, step one is fix the board level procedures. Okay, The first thing that has to work properly is the board. The second is uh, define objectives and strategies for every element of the organization in detail. The third is re-engineer the internal organization to fit the new organization chart that is desired. The fourth is strategic resourcing. How the organization allocates staffing and money inside the organization should be reflecting what are the strategic priorities and a sense of which of these functions is weak or strong. Okay, so if hypothetically we think that the regulation making is in great shape, then on the margin we should be pulling money out of that and putting it into enforcement or vice versa. But a strategic perspective on resourcing is the function of the board. That is what a board should be doing. It should be constantly allocating money between departments based on a sense of which department is doing well and which department is doing badly. Step five, uh, to frame and publish handbook compliant bylaws com covering all the steps. Regulation making, registration, recognition, notices, investigation, collection of information and enforcement. So all these should be governed by bylaws that are done in a handbook compliant way. Step six is uh, the creation of detailed performance measures at the level of the staff. And finally, step seven is reporting, where the organization produces performance measures in the annual report and releases them into the public. Okay, So this would be our seven-step plan for how to implement the transformation of FMC. And as I said, our reckoning is this is one year of work and it, it should all be feasible in one year. I'm going to skip through the details. Uh, under each of the steps, we've, we've got detail and I'm happy to come back. So under step one, the board, step two, the objectives and strategy is action 2.1, action 2.2, action 2.3. You know, we, we, we're happy to share this documentation. Step three, uh, it's interesting. The, what is on the slide here is the existing organization of nine departments and divisions. And you know we would argue that this is a better organization structure where there is regulation, supervision, enforcement, information, and administration. I think that's a cleaner organization chart. Uh, next, I come to strategic resourcing. I already uh, talked a bit about uh, that. On the uh, skill and the resourcing, uh, the current workforce is 80, and uh, you will need to increase the capacity to a significant extent. A lot can be done by recruiting non-tenured staff and we want to give you an example okay here is the us cftc 
the US CFTC has uh, 65,000 registered uh, regulated entities. Okay, so it's a giant operation. It deals with the complete derivatives market in the United States. It's not just commodities. Too. Now, in uh, 2006, it had 435 people. Uh, in 2013, it has asked for budget for 1,000 staff years. This sounds familiar. Okay, so you, you can see the kind of scale up that is going on. And a lot of this is being done through consulting time. It's being done through uh, non-tenured staff. So you can contract through which you get a man year of staff time, but it doesn't necessarily have to be full-time staff. So we want the resource. We don't necessarily want the headcount. And we can choose uh, how we want to think about it. But again, we would encourage thinking about this in terms of man hours. That each function should be costed in terms of how many man days of time do I want in the enforcement function to get a reasonable coverage. So you know, how many man days of in inspection is required for NCDX. I think that's the way to start thinking about it and then work backwards. This is the amount of resource that uh, we require. Uh, I'm going to skip through the details of step five. I'm going to skip through the details of step six and I'm going to skip through the details of step seven. Okay, so to conclude, uh, we would argue that there is a lot of rigidity in the field of agriculture in India. It, there is a lot of misallocation of the wrong decisions being made in production and storage. The futures market is the key technology through which the private sector will make wise decisions on production and storage. And that's an incredibly important input. The role of the futures market is thousand times bigger than the tiny sums of money that play on the futures market. The role of the futures market is it is the brain running the entire 15% of GDP that is agriculture. And that it doesn't matter that the open interest is 0.15% of GDP. Okay. The significance is vastly out of proportion compared to the apparent actual participation. And that should shape our strategic picture of what we want as an efficient commodity futures ecosystem. Uh, we should be aiming to build a world-class forward markets commission with the right organization chart, the right internal process manuals, the staff training. And uh, our sense is that we can go 75% of the way even without the IFC being enacted as law. Okay, so we can take a whole bunch of the good governance principles from IFC and turn them into bylaws and internal process manuals and so on and really achieve a quantum leap in the working of FMC. So with this, I'd like to stop and I can come back to many of the details in the show. Thank you. So I'm sorry I've eaten up a lot of time and now we have your comments. Okay, uh, I don't know everyone. Not everyone knows me. So my name is Ramesh Abhishek, Chairman Forward Markets Commission. So uh, this has been a, a brilliant presentation as expected. Uh, I think this roadmap for turning FMC into a very kind of an example of a regulator is quite doable because the laws uh, FCRA is to be amended and there are a lot of scope for doing a number of things which have been mentioned here within the framework of FCRA, even existing FCRA. The importance of future market has been brought out very uh, very well. Uh, till about two years back, the commodity futures market generally had a uh, poor reputation in the country because of uh, examples of market abuse from time to time. And uh, we have tried to improve that perception by bringing about a number of reforms in the market, the way it's work, it has worked. And there has been, uh, of late, things have been much better and perception also, I think, has improved. So this definitely gives a very good uh, uh, background and base to build a good futures market. And, of course, for that we need a strong regulator and a regulatory regime. There are a number of things which uh, need to be done. We are already in the process of doing some of them, like re uh, removing the entry uh, barriers, etc., i just like to point out that uh, the good futures market also works when the ecosystem also is uh, properly developed. We have a, a problem that uh, the physical market, as we know, uh, has a number of uh, issues. Is There is a lot of opaqueness about the physical market. 
there is restrictions on movement of goods around the country because of tax issues, because of APMC laws. There are, of course, uh, severe constraints of warehousing, quality of the produce, etc. Is you know, uniformity in uh, quality of produce in many commodities. So there are a number of issues. Uh, also, uh, warehouse receipt financing is very important. So while we do this, I think uh, at the same time, uh, we have to look at how we can also work on improving some of the physical market practices, though it is not exactly the job of uh, FMC as such. The uh, formation of the Warehousing Development Regulatory Authority has been a very important step in that direction. So warehousing, I think, and warehouse receipt financing would be very critical to developing a good futures market because that will ensure that the market abuses are very few and uh, far between. So I think uh, I won't uh, take too much of your time. Actually, everything has been covered, what needs to be done, the importance of the market, and I think just the ecosystem part, I think, needs to be uh, looked at as well because that will ensure that the future market functions properly. A very sophisticated, relatively sophisticated future market has been built in this country on the uh, foundation of a very unorganized and weak and fragmented uh, physical market. So that also you may like to uh, uh, keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, as usual, it's a big a strategic picture. Uh, nobody doubts the economic perspective or the economic purpose and the strategic picture which is uh, given. Uh, Actually, when we embarked on liberalizing the futures market in early 2000, that was the picture, I mean, not exactly as put up, put up by Ajay in his characteristic style in the escape velocity of Jupiter or something, if I can call it. Uh, but we had a two-pillared approach in mind. On the one side, empowering uh, the regulator. On the other side, empowering the market. Might not have been possible to empower the market to the extent as it is laid out exactly for the reasons pointed out by Chairman FMC, uh, that there is a fragmented, weak, uh, dysfunctional physical market with uh, no common market-based approaches in mind uh, anywhere in picture. So the, the, the first uh, devil's advocate I want to play is, should the futures market float away from the fragmented uh, physical market or should it get anchored? So that, is, that will decide whether we can move in the speed with which we are unleashing our vision. So that is, uh, of course, price is a public good, should be a public good. Then uh, are we discovering in the current context, are we discovering the right price uh, in the sense that if the fluctuations are very high, even on discovered prices, in a situation of mark-to-market -market margining, that leads to lots of uncertainties of its own. Like you discovered the December price now, but the oscillations are, the, uh, the volatility is very high. So, and you are in a mark-to-market -market, uh, world every day. So you have, I mean, your uncertainty is not uh, probably reduced even uh, to that extent. So. Uh, the real question is, uh, how do we transform into this uh, uh, world uh, using a, an empowered regulator, when the empowered regulator can be empowered only to some extent? The, there are multiplicity of laws, which many of them are uh, state uh, <laughs> mandate. Only, some, only a few of them are actually the mandate of the central government. So uh, the question needs to be asked, again coming back to the issue of if we can completely uh, go for, in fact, in our own market parlance, where we can go for cash settlement of all contracts, probably some of these issues will get addressed automatically. So then it's a matter of debate, because whether the threat of physical delivery should act as a stabilizing force or not, I mean, I don't have a personal view, but as the market evolves, uh, it should get addressed automatically. Then the movement from individuals to firms, another point which uh, Ajay emphasized uh, uh, this thing. Uh, early in the stage of uh, development of the futures market, again we attempted by involving the securities brokers into the field of commodity uh, markets, which though with a uh, separate legal entity structure it was allowed, so uh, that migration from individuals to firms have taken place to a considerable extent. 
but still in the commodity ecosystem lot of the clients are important individuals there are lots of players from the commodity spectrum in the past who come through maybe now now coming through these brokerages new fames based brokerages but they play a disproportionate role in individual commodities how can we address that issue again because they have very good understanding of how this commodity system works uh, by centuries of experience gone through and how certain things can be bypassed and all those issues because of their peculiar expertise which is coming so the role of the firms in this sector though in terms of intermediation can be reduced at the client level there is lots of uh, hands on experience and experimentation which works here how do we address those sort of issues when we are talking about commodity spectrum fully as a any other type of financial sector uh, uh, product i mean in that sense then of course if if we are looking at futures prices are signaling devices probably in order to just to link with the, link up with the uh, forenoon session rbi may not have to do a bootstrap method of finding out inflationary expectation the futures market will give you a good picture of what the prices at least in the agricultural and other commodities where the futures market will be playing a role so we will have a more systematic uh, uh, way of uh, predicting futures prices using that uh, this thing i mean the futures markets so uh, while agreeing uh, with the strategic uh, vision and the economic purpose there is no different view point the modus of reaching there through one and only an empowered regulator and two how do we dealing or float away from the physical market realities which are still going to be there for at least some more years if not uh, i mean uh, for a long years because i think institutional evolution in our case follows the williamson's uh, time span of a century so <laughs> so it is not a short run of the type which we are discussing so we need to address those issues uh, unless we convert strictly in terms of uh, convert the fina- uh, commodity uh, futures products into strictly financial products thank you since i represent the physical market i think uh just respond to mr nayar that uh, this apprehension that the physical market uh which will provide that auxiliary backbone to the uh, financial uh, futures uh, instruments would not keep pace i think is uh, uh, you you are uh, not recognizing that there is a fair amount of depth in institutional capability and if you create the right economic environment uh, firms like you talked about as you can have brokerage firms coming up you can have certainly credible uh, firms in the physical space providing the kind of services that are required to ensure that uh, you have a complete market system when you talking about agri future futures market without having a backbone we are not suggesting therefore that the uh, spots market will have to grow alongside the futures market but what we are saying is the requirements of the futures market can be adequately met Uh, or there can be adequate response to the requirements provided you have a, reg- a good re- environment a business environment and a fairly good regulatory oversight so i d- i don't see this this uh, disconnect at all and uh, the experience of the exchange that uh, we've been providing services to for instance shows that there's been a huge learning in the last decade and quite a lot of the glitches that were there in 2005 6 are not being seen today the nsel kind of thing is a one off aberration that could take place in any market and that should not become uh, some kind of a, uh, a a viewpoint emerging that you know the, the market is too to, to weak to deal with the requirements of the future market but that's the only comment i have uh, so i have a few points to make one is uh, to dr nair's uh, uh, point about uh, the financialization of uh, commodities Uh, i think in some instances it is possible and in uh, many other instances especially in agri uh, uh, contracts uh, it may not be possible for a long time to come uh, 
so i think the need of the hour is to uh, is to take the physical markets along and to better integrate them right now they are islands uh, you know the futures market is an island and the physical markets are in the various states uh, are, are 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 islands so there needs to be a more concerted effort to integrate these two markets through product innovation uh, membership innovation uh, public private partnerships in with the state governments uh, because the the world of going to financialization of agri commodities i think we are you know in some play, in some commodities may be possible but in many others in my view uh, we are far away from that exercise and it sh we shouldn't shy away from the integration uh, of the physical markets though fragmented though broken though complex uh, uh, into the uh, into the into the futures markets into the formal uh, structure so that's uh, you know that's that's one point and the second point is to your point ajay about uh, professional speculating speculators if i can you know use that uh, name and that's a complete there is a complete dearth of professional uh, speculators one because they have not been encouraged uh, regulatory wise so you know in uh, globally uh, in commodity markets there are ctas commodity trading advisors uh, that form the role of professional speculators uh, there are professional market makers Uh, banks financial institutions are allowed to trade in commodities and they bring professional capital uh, and expertise to uh, to be professional speculators who can take the risk from the producer before the goods reach the consumer uh, and hence a very strong encouragement encouragement to create these uh, new uh, you know institutional capacity uh, in the form of ctas uh, allowing banks and financial institutions to participate mutual funds to participate uh, insurance companies to participate who have legitimate commodity exposures uh, and they are not hedging Uh, or managing their legitimate commodity exposures today so i think a significant thrust needs to be placed uh, to create a professional uh, uh, well uh, capitalized uh, 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 you know backed by knowledge backed by research uh, backed by technology uh, a sort of a new breed of uh, speculators uh, and not not you know not small time uh, speculators who uh, who will think short sighted and think about plugging loopholes or miss you know abusing loopholes in the market uh, to 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 take advantage of short term opportunities but really long term long term players uh, uh, and the and the third is really sort of the the physical infrastructure uh, in terms of uh, as uh, uh, mr shri abhishek pointed out as well in terms of the uh, the primary markets as well as the warehousing sector which is crucial and i think the just we've just although we have you know the commodity exchange accredited warehouses have been around for 10 years uh, right from the day the uh, the market started uh, but uh, in terms of the evolution of the warehouses a lot uh, you know long way uh, needs to uh, we need to travel a long distance uh, the wdr involvement has just started uh, there are aspects of food safety standards uh, that are that are yet not fully fleshed out and how they impact uh, uh, you know the warehousing system uh, the gst uh, thing is still you know out there Uh, uh, followed by lo logistics transportation bulk storage uh, so there's a you know there's a come how do you link uh, warehouse warehouse receipt financing in the in the structure so i think these would be the three aspects that should perhaps be additionally considered in the construct of having a mature and highly liquid uh, 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 commodities market uh, in addition to i think the various points that were made so far there are uh, issues which can be handled right away Uh, there are issues which will <coughs> involving a consciousness among the states and and the central government. But things that can be done to spur the sector. All of us know that there is a huge deficit of warehousing uh, space, but no significant step. Only proton steps have been taken. Public-private partnership will only get viability gap funding because they will get infrastructure status. Some capital allowance has been given. But the core is that viability of agri warehousing is suspect. That's why why people large investment is not coming into warehousing. Uh, so there are certain things about which uh, I have spoken several times. One is RIDF using of RIDF funds into agri warehousing because agri warehousing is as critical infrastructure as rural roads or ponds or electrification. That came, but Uh, I don't know on what tax it was taken away, so no private sector could uh, gain out of it. RBI had just been given in the last budget for five thousand crore to invest into uh, agri warehousing. We are not sure what will be the rate of interest because all of us must remember that cost of capital for creation of warehousing space, agri warehousing space, is very very critical. And eleven percent, twelve percent is not sustainable. Twelve to fourteen years is the normal payback period for an agri warehouse. So, first and foremost, which can be done and done quickly, is that RBI 
while deciding on the direct agri norm, RBA when deciding uh, MBI committee was formed and uh, direct agri, direct agri, etc. There was not much of uh, revision that was proposed. Not much, though I saw getting translated into the revised revision of the priority sector, but something that can be done to low hanging fruits like up to a particular tonnage or in a geography, if an agri warehouse gets constructed by a by a through a loan from the bank, that gets classified as direct agri. That will straight away bring down the rate of interest for minimum two hundred TL basis points. One. Two is that why should agri Warehouse repayment gets corrected to SME repayment connection. That an SME loan needs to be. But one, one where major thing like say WDRA passed in 2007, enacted in 2010, we have not seen much activity on the WDRA side. And being a banker, I am running a company where banks are actually lent 40,000 crore against uh, warehouse receipt. It's not only about the negotiability of the warehouse receipt. So. These issues, how WDRA can quickly, now that WDRA has itself has taken a long beat, FMC has now uh, mandated that all warehouses which have to deal with uh, exchange uh, delivery have to be WDRA indicted. Where WDRA, like FMC, as you rightly pointed out, FMC has not been equipped uh, for the regulation that it is uh, expected to do. Same with WDRA, WDRA has also not been equipped as much as they should be to uh, run because we have taken some WDR reputation and there have been no audits, not even a single audit on the way to see whether what we are doing is right or we are committing any, anything wrong. And the second and probably most important thing is that a single regulator. I think in warehousing sector, in physical market, in futures market, one thing that is actually becoming a trouble for the physical market is a single regulator, particularly in warehousing sector. If that happens, I am sure that a lot many of the problems and yeah. so, if you're from China, I'll ask you, yeah. 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 a small uh, point. I just want to find that, uh, uh, like what he said about uh, cash uh, settlements and all that, this throws open another area of what is the extent of regulatory uh, powers or oversight powers which should be given to FMC, I mean, or which FMC should take on, because keeping in view what happened in 2008, you know, when there was the uh, shift from the financial ma markets to the commodity markets, you know, there was the ease of uh, funds flowing from financial to the commodity markets. So that created a lot of that, that. That's when we realized that actually they were not decoupled. They were actually very closely linked to the financial markets and commodity markets. So the oversight became a big issue world over. That how much, to what extent should these commodity regulators have powers to so that they don't stifle the markets, like speculators coming in, they don't stifle. At the same time, they allow the markets to function in a regulated way. So that is something which has to also to be... Worked. But I would just give you a rule of law answer, which is they are a creature of Forward Contracts Regulation Act. I agree. No more, no less. I mean, they have to... No, will it change know, in this, uh, this thing or... Under the IFC, many things will change. Yeah, but that's I, what I'm saying. So this the, has to be kind of... Yeah, the uh, discussion that we tried in this slideshow was holding Forward Contracts Regulation Act unchanged, what can be done to make FMC more effective? But that the larger questions uh, have been answered by Parliament when they wrote Forward Contracts Regulation Act. Regarding the cashless, uh, you know, cash settlements and all, which is not there in this thing, it's basically delivery-based. So yeah. If that changes, then other things also change.